well, if it's up to me, I would ask these young people to continue playing and we would skip the sermon. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you all so much. Gorgeous music leading us in worship. Well, the scripture that the sermon is based on is a familiar one to you. We're going to be listening to the very final words of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28. And we will begin with verse 16 and conclude with verse 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. And we pray, dear God, for the understanding of these sacred words. And may they come alive in our hearts and through our voices and actions. Through Christ we pray. Amen. I can't tell you how good it is to be here. We love coming back to King's Highway. And I want to thank my brother-in-law, your senior minister, David Rice, for the invitation. <clears throat> I want to thank Ellie Bullness for her amazing, wonderful hospitality. What a gift she is. And I'd like to thank and express appreciation to each one of you. Kings Highway Christian Church is a very special place, and you all mean so much to me and my family. Speaking of family... I want to say hi to the Elliots. Haven't had a chance to say hi to them yet this morning. We stayed with Leslie and family last night at their house, and I'm glad that my wife Trila and our daughter Laura are here about halfway back on the uh, right side, my right side. And I wish our son David and his wife Anna were here. Uh, perhaps one day we'll get them here as well. It was two weeks ago today that an article appeared on the front page of the front section of our Little Rock newspaper, the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. And I'd like for you to hear one sentence from that article. According to a seven-year study completed in 2014 by the Pew Research Center, the overall Christian population in the United States dropped by almost 8%. While the number of people who identify as agnostic, atheist, or nothing in particular increased by 6.7%. The article also referred to the Southern Baptist Convention, which as you know, is the largest Protestant denomination in the United States, that they are going through decline. The same is true for many denominations, maybe even most, including us, the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. So it is no secret that we're not as strong as we used to be. That's the bad news. The good news is that we can all do something to help. As far as a recipe for reversing this decline, 
Church growth experts can certainly tell us what the most important ingredients are, but our scripture from Matthew 28 is extremely important because without a doubt, that is our foundation. As we read, Matthew was with his disciples on a mountain in Galilee. Because of Judas' betrayal, they were now 11 in number. And what Jesus said to his disciples is the mission of the church. Go and make disciples of all nations. Our wonderful New Testament scholars, Gene Boring and Fred Craddock, tell us that this is an extension of God's call to Abraham and the promise that he was given back in Genesis chapter 12 that through Abraham, all nations, all nations would finally be blessed. And we need to realize that all nations literally means all people. But you and I know that when it comes to leading people to God through Christ, it's much easier to reach out to certain kinds of people. The ones that we're comfortable with. The ones who look like us and think and act like we do. But Jesus' words remind us that the Christian faith is not any kind of social club that's exclusive to only certain people. It's for all people of all nations, and therefore we ought to reach out to everyone. Now, according to Jesus' words, when people are led to God through Christ, the church, we have two very important responsibilities, one of which is baptism. I'm thinking of Richard Filet this morning. Some of you remember Richard. He was the very first person that I met at Broadmoor Junior High. We were called Junior High back then when our family moved here in August of 1971. I remember meeting him in the office as I checked in to get my class schedule. We started very nice conversation and he asked me why our family moved here and I told him about our father being a minister and that we're now at Kings Highway Christian Church on the corner of Kings Highway and Lyon Avenue and I said Richard if you don't have a church that you go to we'd love for you to come visit with us and that's all it took Richard was here all the time he was active in Sunday school and worship. He was a very important part of our youth group. Richard became a junior deacon. And after he went off to college and married and had kids and moved to different places throughout the country, when they came back here, he would visit Kings Highway. Richard came to Christ right here at King's Highway. And I can still remember the night that my father baptized him. It was in December. It was a very cold night. And after his baptism, I remember going back there to check on him. And bless his heart, he was standing there, dripping wet, shaking like a dog, cold as cold could be. Richard forgot to bring a change of clothes. <laughs> Some of you who have been around here a long time might remember that in one of these rooms back here behind the baptistry, we kept our costumes for the Christmas pack. Richard went home that night dressed as one of the wise men. <laughs> and he and I rode back together to his house, and his parents asked us to make a stop at the grocery.
rubber store, he got some interesting looks when we went through the rubber store, dressed like he was. It was only about four years ago when I got the news that Richard died. He died of heart complications. And I'm so very grateful for this church and what it meant to him. I'm so thankful for those who helped influence him in wonderful ways and for his decision to accept Christ and to be baptized. Like all of us who have taken that step, Richard made a sacred covenant. In so many words, he said, I commit my life to God. I promise to live for the cause of Christ. And he spent the rest of his life trying to understand and live up to those words. Jesus calls us to baptize those who come to him. And he also calls us to teach. Teach them all that I have commanded you. It's the church's responsibility to teach the scriptures. It's all of us, our responsibility, to learn all that we can. We need to learn about God and the way that God wants and needs us to live. We need to learn more about Jesus, who He is, what He did, and what He needs us to do. Christian education is absolutely essential. Jesus began those words with his disciples on that mountain by saying, go and make disciples. And I have an observation about this. I don't know if you can relate to this or not. But my observation is that too many people, either unintentionally or maybe even by design, misunderstand the meaning of the word make. They place too much emphasis on make. And their strategy for leading people to God through Christ involves things like persuasion and fear and guilt. When we moved away from King's Highway in 1989, I had just accepted a call to be the minister of First Christian Church in El Dorado, Arkansas. Very shortly after we moved there, I learned that one of our members was in the hospital, and I went to see her. When I walked into her room that day, she was visibly upset. I didn't know what was going on. Did she get some news that was troubling? Was she in a great deal of pain? tried not to be invasive, but she felt like she could share with me what was troubling. Well, she told me about a man who walked into her room, a complete stranger, not very long before I walked into her room. He just came in, unannounced, no invitation, walked over to her bed and said, I'm here to talk to you about your salvation. Have you accepted Christ as your Savior? And she said, well, yes, caught her off guard. Yes, I'm a Christian, but my church and my minister helped me with my spiritual needs. He very sarcastically responded by saying, well, I don't know your minister. And how do I know that your church does a good job of preparing you in the right way? We need to talk to you about your salvation right now. After all, you are in the hospital and you never know. God just might call you home while you're in here. It upset her tremendously. And she said, I need you to leave. He said, listen, this is a very serious matter. And it's obvious to me that we need to talk about your relationship with Jesus Christ right now. She said, leave right now. Or I'll call.
call in security. And very reluctantly, he left. You see what happens with some people. I think they have good intentions. I hope they do. But their approach is that it's okay to cram the faith down people's throats. And like I said, there are others who use guilt and, and fear. And it's so unfortunate because this is what many people think about when they consider Jesus' mandate to go and make disciples. That kind of approach keeps many people from participating in Jesus' command. We don't like the way certain people do it to us, and by God, we're not going to do that to others. So oftentimes, nothing is done. And it hurts the Christian faith. And it hurts the church. You remember when Jesus sent the disciples out to the villages and towns to preach and teach and heal? He didn't tell them to argue or force their way in. He said, if they don't welcome you and listen to you, shake the dust off your feet and move on to the next place. Jesus did not force or guilt people into following him. He opened the door. He gave them the opportunity. And let them choose. What a great example for us. So how do we make disciples? First of all, I want to make sure you put yourself at ease because you don't have to preach to people. I think, I think the most effective way is to simply follow Jesus' teachings and His example. Loving people, praying for them, helping them, caring for them, inviting them to church if they don't have a church home, and if they don't respond in a positive way, that's okay. Leave the rest to God. The Christian faith is losing, folks. The church in general, all across the board, is declining in many ways. We need to do our part to help turn it around. And when I say we, I don't just mean ministers. David. Ellie and Jesus, they can't do it alone. They need your help. And I want to encourage you to open your eyes and your ears to look and listen because there are people out there who need the Christian faith and need the church. Look for someone who needs good news in their life. Look for someone who's lost and doesn't have a church home. Look for someone who needs meaning and, and purpose in life, who's lonely and feels left out like nobody cares.
King Scottish New Testament interpreter said it so well. We're sent out with the greatest task in history. And with us is the greatest presence in the world. Go. Make disciples. 